The green colour of algae and of cabbages, pine trees and grasses all comes from small green bodies called chloroplasts within their cells. Chloroplasts are distant descendants of once free-living green bacteria. They still have their own DNA and they still reproduce by asexual division, building up to a substantial population within each plant cell. As far as a chloroplast is concerned, it is a member of a reproducing population of green bacteria. The world in which it lives and reproduces is the interior of a plant cell. From time to time, its world suffers a minor upheaval when the plant cell divides into two daughter cells. Roughly half the chloroplasts find themselves in each daughter cell, and they soon resume their normal existence of reproducing to populate their new world with chloroplasts. All the while, the chloroplasts use their green pigment to trap photons from the sun and channel the sun's energy in the useful direction of synthesizing organic compounds from carbon dioxide and water supplied by the host plant. The oxygen wastes are partly used by the plant and partly exhaled into the atmosphere through holes in the leaves called stomata, singular stoma. The organic compounds synthesized by the chloroplasts are ultimately made available to the host plant cell. Interestingly reminiscent of the Mixatrix tale, some chloroplasts show evidence of having entered plant cells indirectly by piggybacking inside other eukaryotic cells, which would presumably have been called algae. The evidence is that some chloroplasts have a double membrane. Presumably the inner one is the wall of the original bacterium, the outer one the wall of the alga. As with Mixatrica, we can see recent reenactments in the many examples of single-celled green algae being incorporated in the cells or tissues of fungi and animals, for example the green algae that inhabit corals. Those chloroplasts that have a single membrane presumably enter directly, not on the coattails of algae. All the free oxygen in the atmosphere comes from green bacteria, whether free-living or in the form of chloroplasts. When it first appeared in the atmosphere, oxygen was a poison. Indeed, some people colourfully say it still is a poison, which is why doctors advise us to eat antioxidants. It was a brilliant chemical coup to discover how to use oxygen to extract originally solar energy from organic compounds. This discovery, which can be seen as a sort of reverse photosynthesis, was entirely made by bacteria, but a different kind of bacteria. As with photosynthesis itself, bacteria still have a monopoly on the technology, except that again, as with photosynthesis, eukaryotic cells like ours give house room to these oxygen-loving bacteria, who now travel under the name of mitochondria. We have become so dependent on oxygen via the biochemical wizardry of mitochondria that the statement that it is a poison makes sense only when uttered in a tone of self-conscious paradox. Carbon monoxide, the deadly poison in car exhausts, kills us by competing with oxygen for the favours of our oxygen-carrying haemoglobin molecules. Depriving somebody of oxygen is a swift way to kill them. Yet our own cells, unaided, wouldn't know what to do with oxygen. It is only mitochondria and their bacterial cousins that do. As with chloroplasts, Molecular comparison tells us the particular group of bacteria from which mitochondria are drawn. Mitochondria sprang from the so-called alpha-proteobacteria, and they are therefore related to the rickettsias, which cause typhus and other nasty diseases. Mitochondria themselves have lost much of their original genome and have become completely adapted to life inside eukaryotic cells. But like chloroplasts, they still reproduce autonomously by division. Although mitochondria have lost most of their genes, they haven't lost all of them, and this is very fortunate for molecular geneticists, as we've seen in many places throughout this book.